meditation of him shall be sweet because I love him. I will give my heart in celebration, lift my voice on high, make a joyful noise. This is Rick Patterson, your teacher, your mentor for the day. And uh, I'm going to share some things with you based upon last week's teaching. I told you I I, I ran out of time last week. And, you know, I'd like to continue on with some of those teachings and and go on and on and on, which, you know, when you start to understand some concepts in the scripture, you can literally begin to teach for hours and hours at a time. Unfortunately, most people who watch these broadcasts on the Internet have a very limited time in which they'll listen. That's why people are watching all the shorts and the reels. You know what a short and a reel is. A short is a three to five minute little presentation. A reel is a uh, one to two minutes. They go to uh, they go to the uh, different formats, okay? And uh, those formats are very small, and people are you know, they'll go through one reel after another. That's not what you're doing here at Christ Life Center and the teaching. We go into some things that most churches and Christians will not even go into. And uh, one of the things that we're going to go into today is how you escape the church matrix. Now, you've all known, and I've taught about the matrix, the movie that was very popular back in 1999. It's sequels that uh, the three sequels. And, uh, I mean, I told you that when I saw the movie, the matrix, the first time I sat through it three times in a row at the same time, just getting up to go to the bathroom and get me something to drink, coming right back and watching it again. It literally transformed because I began to see the parallels between everything in the natural life, as well as everything in the spiritual life. So I, I want to talk about how you see and how you can see the church matrix, and how you can escape that, and how you can move into a different reality. Now, last week we talked about, um, in John chapter 3, two weeks ago, you must be born again, or born from above. And again now, Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. He also said to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus kept asking questions. If you go to the Message Bible, he says, listen, I, I don't understand. He says, um, "I'm you're a, a religious teacher. You are a scholar, and you don't understand the basics. You keep asking me questions and rejecting the obvious truth that is presented to you. So today I'm going to challenge you and uh, challenge some of the things that you have been taught and you understand. And I'm going to use the chart that God gave to me back in 19 or 2001 as I began to understand some very important principles. And over the years, I have taught this over and over. And someone says, I've seen these charts before. Yes, you have. But do you really understand them? Because if you really understood them, your entire perception of you, who you are and your reality would dynamically shift. Now, going back to Genesis chapter 7, or chapter 3, verse number 7, through 11, immediately the two of them did see what was really going on. They saw themselves naked. They sewed 
fig leaves together as a makeshift clothes for themselves. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. Okay. And God said, Where are you? Verse number 10. I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were separated from God's love? Who told you? Remember last week we talked about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And remember the prodigal son, his perception of returning home and his fears was completely different than the perception and the acceptance the father had. You remember his perception was, I don't know if God, if my father's going to receive me. I don't know if this, I, I don't know. I, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. The father's perception was, what are we waiting on? Go get some clothes. Go get a, to a service. Go get a, a gold ring. Go get the best sandals. Kill a fatted calf. We're going to have a party because my son who was dead has returned home. Man, I, I don't know how much that does to you. As a father, I know when my, when my daughter, for example, comes home, I don't care what she's done or hasn't done. I don't care how long she's been away. Every time she comes, my heart expands with love and grace and thankfulness. My son, my daughter, has come home. All right, so let's go into this today. Last week, in John chapter 14, verse number 20, and I gave you this little illustration, it's coming back to your right mind. It's coming back to that mind, that mind block that we have, that cognitive dissonance that we have, that we've been taught from our churches and from our denomination. We've been taught something that is clearly different than what Jesus taught. Jesus taught in John chapter 14, verse number 20, In that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and in you in me, and I in you. Jesus began to lay down the principle that there was no separation between him and the Father, and no separation between you and God. And when he says in John chapter 3, verse number 10 to Nicodemus, you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't even know the basics. <laughs> I'm going to suggest to you, most churches don't even understand the basics. They don't understand this chart. They don't understand John 14, 20, because they have been repeatedly busy teaching you year after year after year after year after year, teaching that you are separated from the love of God, even though Paul clearly says nothing can separate you from the love of God. And let me just tell you how it works. It's, it's really kind of simple. And this is why I'm telling you that it's important that you need to understand how to escape the deception or the trap of the church matrix. Now, what is the Matrix in the movie? The Matrix in the movie was a system of control, a manipulation. Controlling the reality, controlling the, 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 the perception of where you were and how you are and what you are in a computer simulation. That's really what it is. Now, <laughs> when we have people talk about the political Matrix and we talk about being awake as far as politics and being awake as far as the new world order. Now, that is a one dynamic in the natural realm where we are awakened into how the controllers work. And over the years, I've tried to tell you, you in this natural world, there's a controllers 
that begin to control and manipulate your perception, your reality, and how you believe. That's the matrix in the governments, matrix in the educational system. There's also this deception in the church world that we want to address today. Because there are the controlling agents that attempt and try to keep you from finding out who you really are. Because the moment you find out who you really are, you're now released into another dimension. All right, let's look at this chart that I've been giving you over the years. And uh, I want to break it down. It is something that um, once you see and you understand, things begin to change. Now, let me break it down. First, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 18. Paul says, that which is seen, the natural, is temporal and subject to change. Then he says, that which is unseen, what does he mean by unseen? Unseen by the natural eyes is eternal or the spiritual. Now, when I talk about escape or the deception of the church matrix, now if you look at the bottom triangle, and you see that red line separating the top triangle from the bottom triangle. I want to go through it again, and I want you to understand. Your natural identification is based upon your environment, wherever you were born, the family you were born in, the country you were born in. You understand that if you were born in, in uh, let's say, Africa, your environment would be different than being born in Iceland or being born in England or being born in Arizona. Your environment is completely different. And as a product of that environment, you begin to identify with that environment. So, for example, if you're born in Cuba, and here in Miami, we have obviously a lot of Cubans. The majority of our population is from Cuban or Latin descent. And there is this ongoing identification. The Cuban flag is flown and people have Cuban flags, stickers on their car. And, and they talk about Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. I would have no problem with Cuba or Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico or Haiti or any place. Okay. That becomes your identification in the natural realm. Your environment then begins to create a limitation on your beliefs. That's why I say you're more than your body, more than the limitations of your belief system. Your beliefs then begin to, and if you notice the chart, begins to create your capacity, what you believe you can do and what you believe you can't do. That begins to control your behavior, and over time, your identification in the natural realm below the line is who you see yourself as and who others see yourself as. So, for example, the church matrix. Okay, so let's look at this. You've relived your life. You've gone up this chart. Now you've identified yourself as a doctor. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, a businessman, a musician. It doesn't matter what you identify yourself as. So your identification in the church is, okay, Dr. Jones came to church today. Or Lawyer Jones came to church today. Or Musician Jones came to church today. And we identify them, even in the church, as Dr. Jones. They maintain their natural identity, but now they're born again, according to what we consider being born again. So now I'm not just a Dr. Jones, I now am a Christian doctor. I'm a Christian musician. Now. The dilemma and the matrix is, and I want you to look at the red arrow going downwards. The natural on the right hand or left hand side is how I created my natural identity. Then on the right hand side, the red line going down, I now look at my new identity. I'm now a Christian, but I maintain my natural identity and I see myself as a Christian musician, a Christian doctor. And I attempt to change my behavior in the natural realm. Okay? Let me turn that phone off. Okay? So you attempt to change your behavior. 
So you begin to operate as a Christian doctor, and you know, I'm not supposed to do this, I'm not supposed to do that, I'm not blah, 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 while maintaining your natural identity. Then life becomes this, this um, hamster wheel where you go round and round and round and round, you become, and it's a struggle, attempting to conform in a natural world, trying to become spiritual. That's the trap. That's the trap. So we have seminars. How to become a Christian businessman. How to become a Christian leader. How to become a Christian businessman. How you function as a Christian musician. You understand? This is the trap. Then whoever's teaching that conference, teaching or seminar, begins to put parameters on what they believe it is and how you should regulate your life. That is the deception, and that is the trap. Okay, I don't know if you got that, but I pray to God that you did. Now let's go <clears throat> how you escape. All right, we have the same chart, but now we have a third arrow, the gold arrow, your true identification. Now remember, we start now at that middle line, the red line, Below the line is your natural identification. You're a Christian doctor, you're a Christian musician, you're a Christian housewife, you're a Christian father, you're a Christian that blah, 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 blah. Okay? Rather than understanding who you are and where you came from. We start above the red line and your identification now becomes the great I am. I am. Who I am, y'all got to get this. I am who I am because the great I am lives within me. Jesus said, On that day you shall know that I'm in the Father, and you and I'm in uh, and you in me, and I in you. Let me say that again, John 14, 20. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So my identification above the line in the spiritual realm, I am who I am because the great I am lives within me. So the Christ life, this is where, this is where I, 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 I go different than your, your traditional concept of what it is to be a part of a church. What I teach at Christ Life Center is not for you to conform to a bunch of rules and regulations of a denomination, of a particular theology. I teach for you to wake up to see who I always was, being born from above, and therefore who I am. I am who I am because the great I am lives within me. I then see myself and identify myself with the great I am. That's why in John wrote, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, I know this is redundant for some of you. And this is why it's important for you to listen to this over and over again. I have to teach it over and over again to remind me because we are trapped in this church matrix, which puts us in this paradigm where if I don't live up to everyone's expectations of what it means to be a part of the family of God, then I fail somehow. But as I identify myself with the great I am, remember going back again, I can't believe that I did this. I, the real you, can't believe that the natural you did something stupid. So therefore, I'm no longer limited by the natural, and it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. Christ now is my life. So the journey, so the journey, my friend, is getting to you and I to understand and to not only fully appreciate, but to 
actualize who you are based upon where you came from. Now, you see, you have no problem in the natural doing that. I'm a Cuban because I came from Cuba. Therefore, I like to talk loud, talk fast. I like to eat rice and beans. I like to eat, uh, uh, you, you know, I like to eat this. I like, I'm Brazilian. I like picanha. I'm Irish. I like potatoes. I'm whatever I am. I'm German. So I like Wiener Schnitzel. You know, understand what I'm saying? In the natural, we have no problem identifying with a natural reality of who we are. That's why it's, you know, that's why we have this ongoing. I'm an African American. I'm a Scottish American. I'm a Cuban. That in the natural is the natural. That's flesh is flesh. In the spiritual, that's where we have the hang-up. That's where we go into a cognitive dissonance, where we begin to wake up one day and realize, where was I really born? Where did I really come from? Did I really come from Indianapolis, Indiana Methodist Hospital on September 24th? Is that really where I came from? I remember, and I shared with you, I, I've gone through an extensive uh, genealogy research on my family on both sides, my mother's side and my father's side. And I recognize, and I've taken it back, even back to the 1300s, and uh, realized that in my natural heritage, in the natural, I mean, I mean, there's a great heritage coming from Ireland, coming from Scotland. I mean, going way back. I mean, doing some stuff. And uh, on my mother's side, very similar thing coming from Ireland and Scotland and, 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 and going through this particular process, okay? Now, I need to get uh, my, my phone here, begin to hear something and begin to start talking to me, okay? So, you know, that's the way these iWatches I work. And I begin to identify with all of those things, okay? And I remember when I brought to talk to my wife, Sherry, and I said, Sherry, I said, and she, she comes from an Irish German descent. And I said, look, Sherry, I went back on your father's side and your mother's side and, and you know, where they came from. And she looked at me, she says, is that really where you came from? Or is that where your body and your genetics descended from? Where did you really come from? Who are you really? Are you that body? And as Jesus talked about in John chapter 3, he says, look at the baby. That baby's body, you can look at it and you can touch it. But that body is a lifeless form until the spirit comes within us. Look at your natural body. When your body in the natural dies and the spirit leaves, it is just a pile of dead meat. No life. The life left and left a dead body. Obviously, that body was not me. And that body when I was born was just a body until the Spirit came into it and gave it life. So really, where did I come from? Did I come from Indianapolis, Indiana, Methodist Hospital, the third floor, maternity ward on September 24th? Or did I come and again now? from above was i born from above you remember jesus said i and my father are one he said before abraham was i am now the jews had a hard time dealing with that some of you christians have a hard time dealing with what i'm trying to relate to you and the reason you do is because you have been trapped in the church matrix of control controlling how you think, how you believe, so that you can conform to a preset standard. In the church I grew up, we had they had well, what they called the standards, the standards of the church. And those standards, if you measured up to the standards, you were considered a good follower of Jesus Christ. Those standards begin to define you. So 
when I would grow up, okay, for example, a woman could not cut her hair. She could not wear makeup. She could not wear jewelry except for a wedding ring. She had to have a dress on all time. She couldn't wear pants. She had to have a dress below her knees. She couldn't cut her hair. And uh, the men, basically, you know, they had their same kind of standards that they had. They couldn't, couldn't wear shorts. They couldn't go what they call mixed bathing. You couldn't go swimming with, with the opposite sex. And if you did go in, and go into the, to the ocean, you had to have all of your clothes on so that you would be modest. The standards was you couldn't watch television, you couldn't go to a movie, you couldn't play pinball, you couldn't play video game, you couldn't do any of those things because those were worldly things and they were outside the standard. You understand that was the controlling element of that particular denomination. Now, if you grow up in a Catholic church, you also have your standards or your controlling factors that keep you in conformity to that church matrix. Now, when you break out of that church matrix, whom the Spirit has, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There's freedom. And you begin to understand that no matter how, and this was the dilemma that I had throughout my Christian experience for many, many years. No matter how hard I tried to live up to the so called standards that the world system or the church system or the Christian system had created for me, I consistently failed. I consistently failed with my attitude. I consistently failed with my with my actions. I consistently and that set of standards creates the control that when you come to church, I need to bring you to an altar call to get you to repent for all the things that you didn't do, did do or forgot to do that now you have been separated from God. That's the church matrix, keeping you bound to a system of control. On the other hand, when my identification escaping that matrix, and I go above the line, and I now identify with the great I am, everything that I am is not because of what I do, don't do, or forgot to do, or didn't do. It's because the great I am lives within me. Jesus lives with me. Jesus said, I'm in the Father, the Father, I'm in you, and you are in the Father. We're one. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Well, I'm looking at my time and I'm running out of time again. I hope you start to understand to live above this particular red line, which I, this isn't, this is obviously a, a graphic that I think God has given me to try to to lay out in a teaching format, to try to get you to see on a different level. Now, once you see this, you can't unsee it. And once you see conceptually what I have just taught you, you will look at your own church, your own church experience, your own denomination, and you will see how they control. And you will see what God's system was a little bit different. No, not a little bit, a lot different. And you'll start going and looking for a church like Christ Life Center where you can begin to experience the Christ life now in the presence. Now, do I experience all the wonderful things of God all the time, every time, every day of every second? Absolutely not. And I'm the first preacher that you're going to hear that tells you that. I'm going to tell you very, very confidently that if I look at my natural reality versus the spiritual reality, I mean, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it's in conflict and it's always in conflict. So is yours. And even when you, in the church I grew up to, even when you conform to all of the standards, which were almost all external you were still dealing with what was internal, which Jesus was talking about on a consistent basis. He says it's not what enters into a mouth that defiles them. It's what proceeds out of the mouth that defiles them. Jesus talked about attitude. He talked about the inner man. He says man looks on the outward, but God looks on the heart. And one of the big traps we get into is when we begin to judge others 
based upon what they do, and we judge ourselves based upon our intentions. I didn't intend to do that. I'm sorry. Well, but you did it. But I didn't intend to. So in a natural conflict, we always judge each other on what they did rather than their intention or our intentions. And we always judge people based upon their sin, which is different than your sin. <laughs> Let that soak in for a while. So where are we in this? Where are we in this? Okay. And let me just go back because I, I think this is so very vital. Let me pull up pull up the the slide here that I think is so very valuable in your concept, okay? You cannot be less than what God says you are. You with me? I said, you cannot be less than what God says you are. You cannot be less than everything God promised you that you believe that you are. Let me correct that. You cannot be less than what God has declared you to be. Now, you can believe that you're less. You can have someone tell you that you're less. But that's simply a mind game. Because whatever God says you are and who you are is who you are. Okay? So when you begin to think that yourself as less than what God says you are, then what you have done is you've exalted your natural thoughts above what God says, and that puts you into idolatry, mind idolatry. So I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray that you've listened to these messages. If you have questions, write me, rick at patterson.org. Um, but here's what I want to pray. I want to pray... Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you open up the eyes of everyone who's listening to these teachings. Let them see who they really are, where they came from, and what their true identification is in Christ Jesus. Let them see. Let them be awake. In Jesus' name, amen. Remember, I love you. God loves you. Jesus is Lord, and don't you forget it. Please take a moment. Text 73256, Christ Life Center, in one word. Send us a donation and an offering. I thank you for being with me today. God is a great God. And you are who you are because the great I am lives within you. I'll see you next week. Thanks for being with me. I'm Rick Patterson.